precludes him from being a man. Not a lowly, lowly fallen mortal man, of course, but if that is all you can see in men, your vision is extremely limited. Remember, man was made in God's image. Does that mean nothing to you? Is that part of the Bible you would like to ignore? Oh, that's right. You only believe Paul, uh, and that was written, and what, and that was written by Moses. I see. Uh, thank you for your additional insight on First Peter three eighteen nineteen uh, four six. The spirits in prison are living according to God and the Spirit because the gospel of being the gospel is being preached to them. But perhaps one reason is it's it says they must be judged according to men in the flesh is that they did not yet have the temple work done for them. <clears throat> Only when the work is done, especially baptism for the dead, can they obtain justification for the sins they committed in the flesh. That is an interesting and new depth to the passage and that I missed before. Aha. While we read that, it really sounds like God just, Christ went down there and preached, you know, and then led captivity captive, you know. Wasn't making them, wasn't baptizing for the dead, that sort of thing. Excuse me, Ralph, but do you have the same Bible as I do? In the Bible I have been reading, Christ has a body of flesh and bones, Luke 24, 36 through 43, and in that state, he was said to be the express image of the Father, according to several passages from the writings of Paul. But would, but what could be clearer? God the Father is exactly like Christ. When is that said to be true? After Christ is resurrected with a perfect, glorious, physical body of flesh and bones, does two and two equal four, Ralph? In Mormonism, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are equal. However, Christ is in subjection to the Father. Or haven't you read the New Testament lately? May I recommend the Gospel of John? He was an inspired writer too, but if you only believe Paul, uh, try the 15th chapter of First Corinthians. <laughs> yeah, we read it, and it wasn't very convincing about what he's trying to say here. The only thing that's twisted in your theology, Ralph, and the only reason biblical Mormonism seems oxymoronic, uh, oxymoron, <laughs> oxymoronic, I almost said oxymoronic, oxymoronic to you is because of your complete lack of understanding of the Bible. You... My dad understands a lot of Bible. Believe me, he does. That's all he does is studies the Bible. You believe only Paul and when and then only the things he said that appear to support your theology. Of course, you do not strain at swallowing the creeds whole, <laughs> even though they have nothing to do with the Bible. The truth the truth that are the three who are God and that those three are one is taught in the Bible, but the Trinity is not. Well, it doesn't mention the word Trinity, but it's from there's certain scriptures in there, like uh, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. You shall have a child unto us a child is born, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. That sounds pretty convincing. Sounds like Trinity to me. Uh, the truth that there are three, uh, uh, and the, but the Trinity is not, it, cla it claims that this is a mechanical truth, using the word homo, homo, homoousios to express the, ex the, ex the essence of this dogma, but that word appears nowhere in the Bible. You don't know the Bible if you think the Trinity is taught there. And really, Ralph, I thought you were smart enough to know that the Lord's admonition not be not to add or to subtract the Bible from the book of Revelation applied to the to that book and any other written manuscript of Scripture, not the canon as a whole. I mean you, you can add things to the book uh, to the Bible? Otherwise we'd have to throw out everything after the first book of Moses. Well, this is this has been interesting. If you ever stop to realize that there is no biblical way to get out of obeying God's commandments, I'm afraid I will see you throw out the Bible altogether. You must love sin a lot to hang on to it so desperately, Ralph. He really doesn't know my dad at all. Even in all those letters my dad sent him. Oh well. Good luck in life, but I must say, I fear for the worst, unless you finally decide to surrender your will to the will of all, I mean God. 
All my love and best wishes, Richard. Richard. Uh, P.S. This is the last letter. Consider the questions to be rhetorical. <laughs> anyway, here's my dad's reply to that letter. This is April 12th, 1995. Dear, dear Cousin Richard, Thank you for correcting my spelling of the word valiant in your latest epistle. Since you are so kind, I felt that I might return the favor by correcting your grammar. One, it is quite clear from the Bible that God made the heavens and the earth out of that which to you or I would appear to be nothing. Scientists call them quarks, the basic building blocks of all matter. How God created quarks, I have no idea, but he did a good job of it, because now there is plenty of pre-existing material from which to create worlds without end. The above underlined position, pre 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 propositional phrase, should read to you or me, since the object of a proposition is always in the objective cause. You're welcome. Well now, Cousin Richard, which is it? You keep telling me to read your book more accurately to get a better grasp of what you are saying. You doubt if I even read your book. Well, well, guess what? I doubt you have read your book. I, I doubt you've read your own book. No, I'm not being hypocritical. I really am glad you wrote your book. Of course, when I see such glaring inconsistencies and obvious self-contradictions, you accuse me of lying and supposing that I learned my Mormonism, Mormonism from evangelicals. Oops, now I suppose you will use the I just to look it out of context ploy. Well, here goes anyway. On page 105 of your book, and I quote, Intelligences, as indicated in chapter 2, Mormons believe that nothing is created out of nothing. Even the spirits of men were organized out of something. Quote, like God, each individual intelligence, quote, uh, each individual intelligence has always existed as a fundamental building block of life that cannot be created. Doctrine and Covenants 93.29 This eternal element within which each man and woman, why didn't she capitalize these words, Richard, is critical to their ultimate destiny, deification. Which is it, Richard, since you're the expert in Boolean algebra? Mutually exclusive? Yes, I do understand that. But how you can have God creating quarks from which pre-existing material can evidently emerge. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Which to create worlds without end, and yet believe what... And I believe what you wrote in your book, how, quote, Mormons believe that nothing is created out of nothing. Which is it, Richard? Are quarks nothing, or are they something? And what are they really, quote, to you or to me, unquote? Are you denying the power of God to create something out of nothing, as in Dr. Covens 93.29, or do you really believe that he, he actually has some power, although minimal to the God of the Bible, to actually create these things, these, these nouns, Richard, things called quirks. Which am I supposed to grasp? Which is true Mormonism? This is not a rhetorical question. Or do you see any difference between organizing pre-existing material and actually creating something out of nothing? Are you the one that assumes there is no difference? That bara can mean both? Not any dictionary I know, including my Hebrew dictionary. Love, Ralph. Anyway, uh, and then my dad wrote this letter on the 19th of February, uh, 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 on April 19th, 1995, and this is a good letter. Dear Cousin Richard, it is definitely not hypocrisy. My son Bruce and I both feel that it was doubtlessly the hand of God that caused him to go to L.A. and get a copy of your great book, and a great book it is. It was also the hand of God that caused him to come to Susanville for a CO test where he found your letter to me, April 9th. We discussed every point that you made in that letter, and Bruce thought so highly of your letter that he made some photostatic copies. I certainly was not about to make a copy and send it to him. With scripture, we were able, Bruce more than I, to take your letter of the 9th and answer every point that you made. I was really impressed with my son's knowledge of scripture. He also pointed out how the scriptures you used to prove pre-existence prove just the opposite. 
and we use the Bible, King James Version, that we got in our Mormon church here 26 years ago. That is one great Bible. It is large print that it has referenced after after the verse, verses one of which prove that the truth of that Psalms quote you gave us stated exactly the opposite of what you said about pre-existence. We got the Bible free because we were full tithe payers. But it is definitely true, cousin. We asked that God would bless you and your parents beyond what we could ask or think. This is because you have been such a blessing to us. We are serious, starting with Uncle Bob and his letters, then yours. Nothing has made us get in and see what the Bible really says more than the Hopkins family. Of course, we also believe that there is a possibility of you all landing in like a fire, but we have seen so much answer to our prayers, and the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, that we feel that God will honor these prayers too. It is not that we are so conceited to think, to think that we have any righteousness of our own. No way. It is just that we believe Paul, that's God, that God's righteousness, which is the only righteousness worth more than filthy rags, has been imputed to us, as per Romans 4, and the fact that, quote, he made a sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. It is true. You have to be perfect to get to heaven. And since Paul says that we are perfect, we have the assurance. We just wish you had that assurance, too. No Mormon temple, uh, no Mormon can have that assurance while a single Mormon temple stands. They are monuments against that good news. I still think that it is passing strange that God, who is omnipresent, fills the whole universe except that for temples made with hands. He did not say this about the Jewish temple. This is a definite dispensational change. Mormon temples are complete denial of Christ's work, of Christ's words through Paul. They are monuments of, to works for salvation. You can't even have eternal life without being married in a Mormon temple. And Doctor, Doctrine and Covenant, Doctrine and Covenants 132 goes even beyond that into polygamy as a necessity for eternal life. What Joseph Smith really restored was the different degrees of the Masonic Temple. He was a master mason, and he even claimed the legend of Enoch for himself. When you get up into the highest levels of Joseph, as Joseph did, you find some very interesting things. Quote, Lucifer the light bearer, <clears throat> strange and mysterious name to give to, to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears a light? and with its splendors, intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Here are some more sacred, not secret, revelations of the higher degrees of what Joseph Smith was into. Speaking before the leaders of world Freemasonry, Albert Pike spoke plainly. To you, Sovereign Grand Inspector General, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the, of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us, initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, whose deeds prove his cruelty, you, dec you decided to mischaracterize the restoration as you could laugh at it. That's mm -hmm. so you could